Right. Welcome to a Polar Connect event here. It's Friday, uh, April 18th, 2014. It's noon here in Alaska. Um, and uh, afternoon for most of the schools that are connecting here. Uh, but we are with Russell Hood and the NASA Operation Ice Bridge Project uh, for 2014 through Polar Trek. So we will turn it over to Russell in a few minutes, but we'll go through a little bit about um, the Collaborate system we have. So thanks for joining us online and um, if folks are joining by phone. You should see your slides changing in front of you uh, on the screen, and so there is sort of a screen of your screen now with some uh, information on how to utilize the system. Slides should be changing on the right side. You have a participant list of who's um, online on the left. Uh, at the very top of that left panel, we are not going to be using video today because of bandwidth issues and connectivity, but there is the option to talk. Um, so if you would like to ask a question or mention something, uh, right in the participant window there's a hand icon. You can raise your hand. We'll call on you and then if you'd like to speak, you just press the talk button down to talk and then press it again when you're done. You can also be asking questions and chatting in the chat box in the bottom left of your screen um, and just let us know if you have any questions. If you are connecting by phone at any point, Make sure you do mute your phone or we'll hear everybody in the background or your dogs barking or whoever might be with you. So just let us know if you are um, needing to connect by phone. Also, we had a few introductions from folks that are online right now. We have folks in from uh, Georgia and from uh, Arizona and up in Alaska and also Washington State. If anybody didn't get a chance to introduce themselves, go ahead and type that in the chat box with your name, who you are, and how many people are with you. It would be helpful for us to know how many people are out in the audience. And a little background on the program that Russell Hood is participating in. He is a Polar Trek teacher, and that stands for Teachers and Researchers Exploring and Collaborating. It's a professional development opportunity for teachers to head out to the polar regions, to the Arctic or Antarctic, and be able to uh, participate in authentic research experiences while in the field um, and reporting back to their classrooms. We've been hosting teachers for many, many years, and a snippet here from 2010 onwards, we've had over 60 teachers connecting to the polar regions and back to their classrooms. And Russell is one of our great teachers of this year. He is the first of this year, and there are many more to come in the Arctic. And when we go back into school in the fall, we'll start the Antarctic field season. So check for Polar Connect events with those folks, too. And if you have any questions during the presentation, you can type them in the chat box. But at the end of the presentation, we'll have that chance to raise hands and ask questions um, while, while, to the team that's actually there in Greenland. So let me check back in the chat box, see if there's anything we should mention. Looks like people are signing in. Welcome, Julie. Thanks for letting us know where you are, Mark. And looks like Russell has a couple of people with him. I'm going to turn it over to Russell so he can, he can talk to us more about Operation Ice Bridge over in Greenland. So you should be seeing a slide that says Operation Ice Bridge, Greenland 2014. Russell, do you see that and are you ready to go? Yes, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. We're all set here. Go ahead. I'll uh, turn the mic off if you have anything else to say real quick, Sarah. Yeah, okay. I'll just take it from here then. You can talk right over me, right? Sure can, but I'll try not to. Yes, you can. All right, feel free to. All right, so I'm going to leave the talk button on here and hopefully this all works. Operation Ice Bridge Greenland. Um, this is a uh, slideshow I put together so everybody hopefully can, can uh, get an idea of what's going on up here. I purposely made this thing so it wasn't too technical in nature, uh, not knowing exactly who the audience would be. But if you guys have any more technical questions, I have technical experts either side of me at the present, and uh, they can answer those because I probably cannot. Uh, so I'll go ahead and begin the presentation then. Um, the first slide here is just the introductory slide. So we'll uh, talk quickly about where I am. 
um, there's a red arrow on this Google map here pointing to Greenland. I think I have the red arrow just a little bit further north from exactly where I am. I thought about putting it right where I was, but we're a little bit further south, but on the exact same side of Greenland as this arrow is. And so that's where we are now, Kangalooswak in Greenland. Um, Greenland's a place that has uh, some pretty crazy local names. Uh, being from Alaska, I'm familiar with that. If you get out of Atlas in Alaska and look around at some of the villages there, they're also pretty hard to pronounce. But these are decidedly easy ones for Greenland. Um, <laughs> there are much longer, much more difficult names to pr pr pronounce. But uh, I was amused by the street signs here. They're pretty fun to look at. The sled dogs are kind of an interesting cultural aspect as well. The, a lot of the local folks use them uh, routinely to go harvest uh, their food. So that could be seals or muskox or caribou. Um, unlike Alaska, these dogs are kept on the edge of town, all in a collective uh, pen, if you will, several pens. Um, and so they, they all stay outside, maybe just is quieter that way. It's kind of remarkable how, how they do that and the difference. The sled, as you can see in this slide too, is a decidedly different version from what we see in, in Alaska as well. This is a pretty heavy duty sled compared to what we have. And the dogs, for that matter, are also heavy duty. They use kind of a Greenlandic husky, um, which is a larger, heavier dog than we have in Alaska. Um, just so I thought I'd note that. Uh, this is an amusing picture I took as I was walking to work one day over to the to get on the airplane. It was about minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit and if the laundry's hanging out to dry. Uh, there's some interesting physics there. Does it work? <laughs> um, and it might. The, the, uh, the humidity here is awfully low most of the time. So we could get sublimation and have it, obviously the wet laundry would freeze immediately, but it might sublimate fast enough to effectively dry the laundry. They probably know what they're doing. I certainly don't, but I wouldn't have guessed. Um, and another neat thing about Greenland is that many of the communities have very vibrantly painted buildings. Uh, here's a, a playground on the upper right from a, it looks like a local school, which is about what, two doors down from where we are. Um, and then there's a few other buildings in the bottom picture, which uh, are just a, a couple blocks away from where we are. A lot of them are like this. Some of the communities have almost every single building painted uh, vibrant colors. They're really, really beautiful, in fact, and it adds a lot of color to otherwise relatively bland palette. There's some really neat geology in Greenland. Uh, the, the country as a whole is some of the oldest rock on Earth, and it's kind of an extension of the, the rock that makes up part of the Appalachians, which is also very old. These rocks here in this picture were, were located near the glacier closest to us, ironically named Russell Glacier, as an extension of the ice field here. And you can see the folding and bending that has occurred in these rocks. And not being the geologist, I'd take a stab and say originally they were sedimentary in nature, but then metamorphic processes uh, certainly compacted them into a much harder rock than a sedimentary rock, and also in the process deformed the striations. So they're really cool rocks. And there's a whole lot of them. I could have taken a lot of neat pictures, but just put these in there. The uh, ice, of course, is what we're here for. And the ice that Greenland has is quite expensive in nature. We took a brief uh, trip one day over to this, uh, again, same part of the glacier. And this formation on the uh, edge of the ice field is pretty interesting to think about how that might have been caused. Uh, I have my own theories, but I'll let you guys ponder that one. But it looks like something essentially erupted from the uh, ice on the ground. And you can imagine what maybe something critter came out of that. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. And the bulk of Greenland, though, is buried in ice. And this is what it would look like only on the margins of the Greenland ice sheet, where you have some of the peaks poking through. Those would be called nun attacks. But for the most part, it's actually plain white for the bulk of it. And uh, I didn't include a slide like that, but you can imagine if you look in the distance on this one, that would be what a large portion of this country looks like. So here's the first picture of our plane. And literally, it was one of the very first pictures I took when I got here. Uh, the plane landed the, uh, after flying for the entire day when I landed here myself. And we're out there watching the plane come in. So the propellers are still spinning. They're taxiing in. 
And this is the P3 Orion that uh, is the airborne base for the whole laboratory that we fly up in the air in each mission. You can't quite see it here. It has the cool NASA logo on the tail. Sorry about that. Here's an example of what kind of route we might fly in a typical day. This one is only unique in that it's kind of close to home, so we didn't go too far as the crow flies from where we are in our base in Kangaroosac. But you can get a sense of the grid lines that we, we are uh, traversing left and right, north and south, and so on. The tighter grid lines in this particular case are covering an area of the Yakutovin Glacier, which is a very important region of study because it calves a quite, quite a large volume of ice into the oceans every year. And a lot of researchers spend a lot of time looking particularly at that one. The other ones, the larger ones, follow satellite transits, uh, orbital transits, and they're trying to kind of duplicate in, uh, some of the satellite data. So those actual angled lines are, are there for a purpose. And, uh, if you had a map of Greenland to see the lines that the satellite traverses, they'd all be parallel to those. Here's the, uh, another slide that shows a bit of a, what, what the uh, P3 has been modified to look like for our laboratory here. The bomb bay doors are gone. In place, we have radars. And uh, in the front, we have radars also. Let me see if I can get my pointer here going. Let's see if that works. All right. so. We have three different radars at the front of the plane here based in this location here, the snow accumulation radar, KU band radar. I'll mention what they do a little bit later. The M cords is kind of the big beefy radar in the sense that it takes incredible volumes of data and it has an array of about 15 channels spread across all three parts of the plane, uh, the two wingtips and then the center. Moving further back here, we have a port, a glass port here where there would be two digital cameras pointing downwards to take photos of the ice as we fly over it. And then moving further back here, right behind that is a temperature probe using a passive infrared to, to measure the surface temperature as we fly over. And then we have one of the lasers pointing down here, so the green laser would be coming out here. And I believe, and the guys next to me can nudge me, but I believe the magnetometer, which usually is standard in a P3, has been removed in this case. They're nodding, so I guess I'm right. They don't need that to detect uh, enemy submarines anymore. So that's kind of nice. And Russell, um, I made a few of those little pointers for folks. Just when you're going to use it, just click it so it stays where you want it to be. We don't see your mouse sort of cruising around on the slide. Does that make sense? Okay, I'll, uh, I'll try and do that. I don't have a whole lot of pointing to do anyway. Okay. Um, this, uh, this view here shows kind of the typical inside of the plane. Uh, for the most part, the right-hand side of the plane uh, is where all the instruments are located. And right here, you're looking at some people running one of the ATM uh, devices, and, then one of the, and that's in the foreground. And behind them, those folks are running uh, the big MCORDS radar system. And then lots of uh, miscellaneous cargo on the left. And that, this cargo in the left would involve spare parts for some of the equipment that they use to measure the, the, uh, the radar equipment, the uh, laser equipment, and so on. It's also spare parts for the plane. It's important that the plane is self-sufficient because we're a long way from any, any maintenance uh, facility, to say the least. So here's some of the some of the data that we get. So the, the DMS, the digital mapping system, is comprised of two digital cameras. There are DSLR cameras you can buy at a Photoshop, a store. They're pretty high-end cameras, but not super high-end cameras. The second one is just a, a redundant one from the first as a backup. And this is what they do. They point straight down and take photographs about every 1.3 seconds. It'll it'll vary a bit depending on altitude and speed and so on, but roughly every 1.3 seconds. This is actually a mosaic, not a single photo, but several stitched together that uh, as a, we went past a glacier front here. So on the far left of the screen, you can see the, the, the front of the ice. And if you went further left off the screen, the glacier extends uphill from there. And right in the top middle of the screen is a humongous iceberg. And the sense of scale, I'm trying to remember what this one was, I think this was about a third of a mile across, give or take, from left to right when we, we uh, made this image. The, uh, 
other other things we have running, of course, are the lasers, the uh, airborne topographic map, or the ATM devices, and they're uh, constantly measuring the altitude or the height of the, of the terrain uh, below the plane. One way you can present the data is to color code it. This is not typically what the scientists would do, but it does show you uh, one way to, to present it. And if we take the same photograph you just saw on the last slide and look at it with a color ele color based elevation map overlaid on it, you get this kind of photo. And so in this case, as I say in, in the slide itself, blue is basically the sea level and then the orange is the highest altitude. So the vertical relief on that slide, that picture I just showed you is about 60 meters or give or take 200 feet. And here they are kind of side by side now and you can see very pronounced now that iceberg I was mentioning. It doesn't show up really well in the actual photograph on top, but down below if you look at the uh, the ATM machine data, then you can actually see the, the nature of that iceberg and it's give or take about, the iceberg looks to be 60 meters tall at the highest point above the water, which is in fact actually higher than the front of the glacier ice on the left. You'll notice that the glacier ice on the left doesn't get to those deeper orange colors. So you can't have any sense of that from the photograph, but you can see that the, the laser data really uh, allows us to get a better idea of what's going on. And all the other colors, the, the lighter blues would be just uh, other icebergs that aren't, aren't particularly tall, but nonetheless stick up above the uh, flat, flatter surface of the water. Of course, there's not a lot of water there. It's just a jumble of ice that's broken off from the glacier. All right, this next one here is showing kind of a, in the background is a screenshot from Google Earth map of the Jakobshavn Glacier. And then the transit lines that we I showed you guys in the previous map are now shown in part at least in color. And again, the same color scale pertains here as to the last pictures that you saw using the ATM data. And with this brief overlay, and this isn't hard science here, but you can get an idea of what's going on in the glacier. And if you look at the open water where the icebergs are floating and going to the lower right-hand lobe, you can actually see, and I'll see if I can point, I know Sarah told me the pointer wasn't pointing, you can see here where the, the dark blue is extending further inland on our, by our as, as a, determined by our laser mapping here compared to the Google Earth map. And so that would indicate that since this Google Earth picture was taken, the glacier has calved off quite a bit and hence receded there at that location. So it's kind of neat to see that. Moving on here, this is actually a, uh, another view, a side view, if you will, of the relative altitude of one of the transit lines in that exact picture in the previous slide. Um, and what it is, is right when we, we flew north to south across the, um, the glacier front and you can see what the elevation would look like. So it starts off at roughly uh, from the left, if you will, uh, that about 500 meters in height and then it drops down, has a little shelf and then it drops further down and the very bottom is basically sea level, although there's a bit of noise in there and the noise in the sea level area is simply the height of various icebergs that are floating in front of the glacier front. So here again is another way you can get an idea how tall icebergs are in front of the, the glacier. And if you just take a rough estimate with the scale on the left, that's in, in meters, and look at the height of the tallest iceberg, it might be 40, possibly 50 meters, something like that. So that's a pretty tall iceberg, well over 100 feet tall. And then uh, you can see again, the, the map goes off onto the right, and the sea goes to a height of uh, five to 550 meters or so off the right hand side. So this is just, again, another use of the ATM data. So the four radars on board um, represent another array of, of sensors that they have and they all have different acronyms here. The first one I'll mention is the MCORDS radar and this is kind of the, the big data hog, if you will, that every time we fly a mission comes back with about 1.7 terabytes of data, which is quite a bit. And these guys are mapping with a long wavelength radar all the way down through the ice and kind of pinging it off the bedrock, wherever the bedrock is, deep under the ice sheet. The second radar we use is the snow radar. It measures the snow thickness on top of the sea ice. Um, when we fly over just sea ice, that's an important thing to know because oftentimes they want to determine the freeboard 
of the sea ice, which is the height of the sea ice that is sitting above the ocean, and that determines there again how how effect how much the wind will affect it in terms of moving it around and so on. Third radar we have is the accumulation radar, and that provides in information just about the top layer of ice on the glacier, and they could use that to determine things possibly like how much uh, snow fell one year and so on, but it's only on the topmost layers. It doesn't go very deep. And then the last one is the KU radar, and that determines the actual elevation of the top of the ice, not to be confused with the elevation of the top of the snow that's on top of the ice. So uh, that's a distinct uh, benefit for that radar, get through that snow layer. Next. Here's what the raw radar data looks like. It actually comes onto the computer screens in the plane looking basically just like this. And you can actually make some sense of this right then and there in the plane during the flight. Because you can see the bottom darker bands are actually representing the bedrock. And in this particular case, you can see it's ranging between 2,000 to 2,500 meters deep, or as I say in the slide, two to two and a half kilometers deep. So it's pretty deep ice sheet right here, um, though it can get deeper in, in Greenland. And then you can also make out some of the internal layers of ice. And in this case, you have some folding that's uh, gone, that's uh, occurred, and that, that can be some interesting geological property, processes that make that happen. Hey, Russell. Here's another thing you can do with. I'll stop you for a second. Yep. We got a good question. How deep is the snow on average? I know this varies year by year and by continent, but curious an average for how much there is right now in April at that glacier. Go. Uh, snow on sea ice, or do they mean the thickness of the ice? So how snow deep is the, the snow on average? Snow. On, we're discussing it with the. Yeah, so the, the snow on top of the ice, is that what we're talking about? Snow accumulation on the glacier, got it. Uh, well, there's actually a continuum of snow accumulation on the glacier, and that's the, what glaciologists call fern, F-I-R-N. And fern is what happens, uh, it varies from the, the newly fallen snow at the top, uh, and the weight of that snow gradually compresses the, the uh, snow layers underneath until it goes to solid ice at some point down below. And that varies, the amount of that snow varies greatly depending on where you are in Greenland. Generally, a lot of it in the southeast, uh, as much as several meters of it per year, uh, and very little in the north, which is pretty much a, a polar desert, you know, you know, sometimes just a few centimeters per year. What would you think the uh, snow accumulation would be on average per year at the Yakutov and Glacier? It's a Yakutov is a fairly dry area, I would, I'm guessing here, but it's something like a meter per year. Okay, so about a meter of snow per year in that particular area. We good? Yeah, who is that talking and what is their job? We're still good. That was John Sontag. He's uh, the navigator slash weatherman for the crew. Though he's been around a long time and knows quite a bit about a lot of things. Awesome, thanks. All right, I'll let you jump back in. Sure. So this slide here uh, kind of looks like South America if you look at it, actually. Um, but it's not. It's Greenland. And it's, it's what Greenland might look like if you remove the ice and then also greatly exaggerate the vertical elevation <laughs> because it doesn't quite look that way. But it does have the same, that, that kind of topographic relief. And one of the really cool things that has recently been discovered, and quite recently, actually, in the last few months, was in terms of papers being published about it, was the presence of a humongous under, uh, under ice canyon in the northern part of Greenland. And it appears that this canyon drains out to the north under one of the larger glaciers up there. And the significance of this could be a lot of things. Like maybe there's a lot of water that's uh, running underneath all of that and draining out there. And then if there is that water, does that can enhance the, uh, the movement of ice out through that glacier and so on. But this is the longest, officially the longest canyon in the world, longer than uh, Grand Canyon and also longer than uh, one of the, the canyons in I think the Sangpo River over in China. 
So it's a pretty significant canyon. It's also pretty deep, but it probably doesn't quite have the same, I think it's about half a mile deep roughly on average, but uh, that would be only occur, that depth would occur with quite a bit of width to it as well. So it wouldn't probably have the same dramatic effect that the Grand Canyon have. But nonetheless, this data here was, was uh, stuff that they got from the radars in the Operation Ice Bridge. They all have other radars that other people are using that are, that are essentially the same kind of radar, but the Ice Bridge data was really instrumental in, in this discovery. And I have and a so, uh, yeah. If you go back go to ahead. that other slide, um, I know we've had polar trek expeditions in the past in Antarctica that have looked at lakes underneath the ice. Do you guys think there's any big lakes under there, or does anybody already know? Or is it just full of snow and maybe some streams? Uh, this is John Sontag again, uh, answering the last question. And the answer to that is yes, there is, a, 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 as Russell was talking about a minute ago, there's, there's a lot of very recent discoveries of, uh, of some very basic features in these ice sheets, which to me is incredible how little we, we still know about it. And one of those discoveries was the discovery of one of these subglacial lakes uh, just to the north of Thule Air Base in, uh, in northwest Greenland. That was just discovered within the last year, uh, in part using iceberg data and in part using data from other sources as well. That's the first, uh, you've heard of many, many, many of these lakes that have been discovered in Antarctica and they form what the glaciologists uh, think of as a plumbing system for all of Antarctica. Some of them drain into each other uh, and, uh, and thus affect the, affect the the physical behavior of the ice sheet itself. And so it's probably reasonable to expect that uh, as time goes on, more of these lights will be found in Greenland as well. But right now we know of one. The other thing to note, and this is Jim Young, I run the laser systems, is that the uh, fern, the loosely compressed snow that John talked about uh, earlier, has also been discovered to contain quite a bit of liquid water. Uh, it was very surprising. Some of the teams that went out onto the ice and drove very shallow uh, cores down through the ice actually had liquid water coming up through their uh, boreholes. And so there's an incredible amount of water that's being stored in the loose, not yet compacted snow sitting on top of the ice cap. And that's remarkable and also only discovered in the last year or so. So uh, some quite amazing discoveries. Uh, the, the liquid fern, uh, after they uh, did the ice cores, they came back to the uh, radar data that Russell was talking about and we can actually map those liquid areas from the aircraft. So uh, this is a, an area where the collaboration between the ground researchers on the ice and the airborne are, is very important. So it's uh, it really, really amazing to be up here right now. Sounds like it. This is Sarah again with Polar Trek. There's a few more questions coming in that uh, might be good for the moment. Uh, Liam wants to know, have they named that canyon? And then Jillian's group in Phoenix, Arizona is, or sorry, Flagstaff, um, is wondering if, it, boy, it looks like um, a, a volcano. Was it originally a volcano at any time? Probably not the oldest. Yeah, it probably wasn't a volcano is our best guess here. It was very, very old rock. Think, you know, in ex well in excess of a billion or two billion year old rock. So it may have been one way a long time ago, but it would be quite a long time ago at that. But it could have easily been formed by, you know, an intrusive uh, igneous rock where it solidified underground and was lifted up th through uh, geologic processes. Um, we'll uh, turn around and ask the question, was there a name for this canyon? Do you guys know? Not that I know of. The, the, the canyon was discovered by a colleague of ours named John Bamber, and he's a scientist in the UK. And, and to my knowledge, uh, it has not been given a name. Do you guys have a good name? We could come up with one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that could be a journal coming up for you, Russell. So a few more questions that are pertinent at the moment. I hope it's okay we, we're asking. Mark wants to know, does a lake show up on M chords as a flat or smooth bottom? Actually, they often show up as a flat top uh, because the, 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 uh, the ice on top of the uh, lake reflects, the, uh, uh, reflects the, the, the topography of the lake itself, which of course is flat. So that's one way in which they found these things uh. in, in the Antarctic is, is to look for uh, big little flat surfaces. All right, and Jillian's uh, uh, students want to ask, what causes the pockets 
of water under the ice? Does it have life? That's a great question, Julia. And, and um, <laughs> life is a question that I don't think any the people have thought about a whole lot in, in, in these glaciers. And it seems it seems unlikely to be my first thought, but uh, you know who knows? It, there's there's a lot of discoveries yet to be made, and that's one of them. Uh, in terms of the physics and the thermodynamics that allows this water to exist, um, once it was discovered, there have been a couple of theo theoretical papers that have just started coming out on how this could possibly exist. And, it was a real shock. I, we were here, uh, Ice Bridge was here in uh, Kegelusuak when, when one of the researchers who was out drilling that ice uh, came back. And that was, by the way, a particularly cold year here. It was about minus 40 uh, Fahrenheit when, uh, on the surface when they discovered the uh, basically a liquid water gusher coming out of the drill hole. And when Evan came back and told me about it, he told me about it in the hall here in the facility. And I didn't believe him. I thought he was, I thought he was addled from his time out on the ice because it seemed so unlikely. But um, as it turns out, you know, once the discovery was made, the folks, the, the scientists went back and looked at the thermodynamics of the situation and, uh, and using some fairly fancy computing, they determined uh, that it in fact could exist. But it's certainly not, it's not something that you could explain easily. Uh, you did a good job. That was awesome. Um, I have one last question for now and then we'll let you finish up the presentation and we'll have time for live questions. Peggy is asking, what are the conditions that allow the water to exist as a liquid under the ice sheet? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I, I have, I'm sort of stepping out of my bounds of expertise a little bit here. That, that goes to some pretty serious glaciology and thermodynamics knowledge. Um, and these papers that have been published recently have talked about that to some degree. But one of the things that appears to be important is to have these, these, sub, uh, these permanent fern aquifers, PFAs they call them. Uh, just like an aquifer you have in rock, these exist in the fern. And uh, one of the things that appears to be a prerequisite for their existence is to have a great deal of snowfall. So snow acts as, as a wonderful insulator because of the air that it contains, just like the, um, just like the down in a parka. The, the reason that's warm is, it, is, it, is because it, it traps a lot of the air from your body. And um, snow does the same thing on a glacier or on sea ice or really anywhere in the world that it falls. It traps a lot of air. And that insulates uh, that, that relatively warm water layer for, from the quite cold air that happens in the winter and, and uh, apparently allows it to stay in, an, in, a, in a liquid state even through a very, very cold Greenland winter. That's cool. Perfect. Thanks. Should we move on from now, Sarah? Sure. Yeah, I think we're basically uh, about done anyway, so th those are good timing for questions anyway. Um, basically, one of the last slides here just says that the data from oper the Operation Ice Bridge guys is critical for researchers to uh, fully understand what's going on with the climate and how it affects uh, Greenland's ice cap. And the long-term results are unequivocal in terms of what is going on. Greenland is overall losing ice at an ever-increasing rate. And so, you know, what should humanity do about that? What should we do about the, the melt that's coming off of some of the ice caps and, and, and uh, uh, whatnot in, in Antarctica? Because these are contributing to an overall uh, sea level rise that uh, is going to mean a lot of big things for us coming down the road. Uh, communities may have to relocate, cities may have to relocate, and in some cases whole countries may have to relocate. Think of the Maldives in the Indian Ocean, for example, who have uh, no land that's much higher than about three meters above sea level. So it's a, it's a pretty important issue that we have to think about. This is kind of a humorous slide I'd throw in. Um, it happens. The drone of the plane the, and uh, you know, working hard, watching the computer screen, making sure the data is coming in, and all of a sudden you nod off to sleep. And no, we didn't throw M&Ms or anything into his mouth, though it was tempting. And uh, the last slide here is just uh, for me thanking these guys both beside me, behind me and whatnot, and everybody welcoming uh, into the team and uh, being so gracious with their time and uh, patient with me because I've asked a lot of questions and uh, bent a lot of years. And uh, you learn a lot when you do that. It's pretty fun. And that's it. Any questions? Any more questions?
<laughs> Russell, that's a great picture of you. And there's East High right there. That's awesome. So it looks like, Arnold, you have your hand raised. Um, so whomever would like to talk, uh, Russell, you can turn your microphone off. And then Arnold will have the opportunity to use his to ask a question. So go ahead. Okay, I've got a few questions of my own, and then I've got to see if anybody else in our audience here has any questions to add to the list. Um, the first question I had was I saw uh, the, the picture that you showed that when they gather the data and they show it right on the screen as you're flying over, uh, acquiring more data, it looked like a profile, and it looked like the bedrock was up and down a lot. And my question is, was that a glacier location? And if so, does that mean that the glacier is going over these humps uh, in the bedrock, or, or is it just kind of a, um, an area where there isn't a lot of flow to the ice? Okay, we're live. Yeah, so that's, um, that's a great question, and you, you get to a, the heart of a whole lot of topics in glaciology right there, but, but basically the simple answer is no, it's not an alley glacier. That's, um, that's very, very deep ice, and that occurs near the, near the center of Greenland, uh, probably quite close to, to the summit of Greenland, uh, where we were. Now, the reason I mentioned that that raises so many interesting topics is because not that long ago, uh, the glaciologists of the world had assumed that, that the bedrock of the Greenland ice sheet was smoothed over uh, as if it had been sanded by a lot of sandpaper, which is essentially the, the action of a glacier as it flows over rock. It really ought to round the rock over. And what we've discovered over the years with the MCORS data is in many cases, in a heck of a lot of cases, that is not the case. That the rock is surprisingly rough. And that the, um, and that the, the way in which the ice moves over that rock is actually quite complicated. In some cases there is water at the bottom, uh, between the bottom of the ice and the top of the rock that lubricates the flow of the ice. And in other cases, uh, there are potentially freeze-on effects where the, uh, the ice freezes right on, uh, freezes right onto the rock. And you can see some instances in this particular image of folding, and that may be an instance of freeze-on, where some of the ice um, started to act, as, uh, to in fact act somewhat like bedrock, because it stuck to the bedrock beneath it, and the ice uh, flowed over, the, the surrounding ice flowed over. But yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Arnold, looks like we've got another question. Yeah, we got another question here from East. Uh, hey, Mr. Hood, this is Ray. Um, I was just wondering, you were saying NASA's been there for about 15 years. Your, your whole team has been operating there. And how much the have the glaciers been changing over time? Um, has there been like a net decline or in the, I don't know, the, <laughs> the mass of the glaciers? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm talking again. Oh. <laughs> hey, oh. <laughs> Yeah, this is Jim Youngle with the Airborne Topographic Mapper Team. Uh, that's a very good question, and it's it's really the basis of one of the basis of why we're here. Uh, what has happened? We've been making the measurements here since 1993, and uh, essentially we do the a lot of the lines annually now. And what we're seeing is the center of Greenland is fairly stable. Uh, Greenland is an enormous chunk of ice. Uh, as Russell said, it's, it's almost three kilometers deep in the center. Uh, up high in the Greenland ice sheet, uh, we're not getting much change. Uh, the ice is fairly stable, maybe growing a little in the north, uh, shrinking a little in the south. But around the edges of Greenland, uh, once you get below uh, certain elevations where the warm air of the atmosphere is interacting with the ice and the warm water in the oceans is interacting with the ice, we're seeing remarkable changes each year in the glacier uh, regions. Uh, the Jakobshavn Glacier is uh, the center portion of it near the calving front is losing on the order of six to eight meters of ice every year. Uh, that's one of the places of highest loss. There are a lot of other glaciers in Greenland that are losing uh, ice on the order of a couple meters per year down near the edges. So you can kind of think of it as, as sort of a large uh, scoop of ice cream that's melting around the edges very rapidly. Um, and that's what we're concerned with. Uh, being here for 20 years now, we can see the changes. Some years are very cold years here, and the change isn't very high. Uh, there's been some notable years just recently where the whole uh, surface of Greenland essentially got above the freezing point, 
and uh, those are years where we're seeing a lot of change each year. Uh, but in general, while well, we've seen loss, uh, our data indicates that the, the mass balance of Greenland, the amount of accumulation compared to the amount of loss is negative. So Greenland is losing mass balance and that is ice that is melting into the ocean. All right. Um, and we can go right back to East High in a second. Um, but we have a question from Arizona, from Carly. She's, uh, they're asking what might happen if the glacier cracks or breaks inside the ice sheet? All right, here we go. Ms. John Tontek again. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question and it's something that I personally have not seen in uh, about 20 years of, of doing this kind of work. I, I'm not sure the physics would particularly permit that. Um, if you mean a if you mean a break a crack along the ice while it's still grounded, but uh, the, the reverse does happen quite often where, where the part of the glacier that that, um, that, that flows out uh, and starts to float that part of the glacier is called uh, it's called an ice shelf, and those crack a lot they, they crack fairly often. In fact, we discovered a huge crack uh, about three years ago in Antarctica over the Pine Island Glacier, uh, and but, but I should be more careful with my words. We actually discovered the crack. Uh, over the ice shelf, the floating part of it, and that was going to become uh, was well on its way at that time, and later became a gigantic iceberg that was bigger than Manhattan Island. So it happens a lot where the glaciers float, and I'm not familiar of any cases uh, where it happens over grounded ice. Thanks. And um, back at East High, you guys might have a few more questions. Arnold, I'll let you take the reins there if you do. Hey, it's Jared. Uh, Gus here. Um, I was wondering, you were mentioning moving ice slabs, and that may be the answer to my question, but uh, as in the radar, it, the slab with the radar uh, da raw data, I could see a bunch of different layers within the glacier. I was wondering if in moving they kind of act as, if a, sl as a slab avalanche in which there are multiple slabs and slabs can move over the top of one another. And also, possibly more importantly, how's the skiing? All right, I'll address the skiing quickly and let Jim formulate your answer to the, the deeper question. The skiing in Kangar is uh, not happening. There's simply not enough snow on the ground. You would hit rocks too too frequently. I suppose if you restrict yourself to, you know, the very bottom of a stream bed, you might be able to make it work. But no skiing's happening here. However, there's pretty good base not far away for hundreds of miles, but I didn't bring my skis. And if you went up on the ice cap, you'd really have to watch out for those crevasses. Exactly. As you see in the laser data, some of those crevasses are 20 or 30 meters deep, and you certainly wouldn't want to cross-country ski or downhill ski into a crevasse. Uh, in answer to your question, the layers that you see in the radar data represent um, different years where there's perhaps more dust particles, let's say. Uh, collecting on the surface and that causes a different uh, density of ice uh, down there. So some of the layers can be cor uh, correlate to uh, volcanic eruptions in the world. Uh, and that's one of the ways they can date both the ice cores that they drill through the ice and the radar data that as we fly over an ice core site, you can track the same sort of layers up and down. So they're not really sliding on one top of one another, but they're really compacted down. So this represents that fern that we were talking about, the loose snow that's on top of the ice being packed down into a layer. And the radar sees each of those layers just a little differently. And uh, that's, that's one way of dating the ice. The ice in Greenland, in, in this part of Greenland, is very deep. Uh, the ice cores show about 80,000 years, as I recall, uh, 80 to 100,000 years of, uh, of ice layers down, according to the posters in the hallways here in the gallery. Okay, I think we got time for two or three more questions. Uh, this is Arnold again. One real quick one. I know that we're losing um, ice more rapidly than it's being replaced, but do you guys know, is there uh, any increase at all in the precipitation that, you know, since there's more water melting, is there more falling? We'll turn that one over to John Sontag, the meteorologist here. And for, for the record, 
record, uh, you guys don't need to end this on our behalf. We can go a bit longer. So um, whatever you think, Sarah, in terms of the time frame, we're good with. Uh, here's John to answer that question. Yeah, I'll take the precept question. Um, the answer is yes. Um, we are seeing uh, basically the, the pattern of change that we're seeing both in Greenland and in West Antarctica, uh, not only with our data, but with, uh, with the data from uh, spaceborne gravimeters, from spaceborne altimeters, and various other sources, they all match up fairly well. And what they're showing is, is a, a, some rapid uh, thinning of the ice where the ice comes in contact with the oceans, so it's lower elevations, and a little bit of thickening of the ice at the highest elevations. And that is actually completely consistent with theory that would suggest uh, a warming climate because warming, uh, warmer air has, has a greater capacity to carry moisture. And so if the atmosphere were to warm up, you would expect a bit more uh, snow to fall because that atmosphere is more capable of transporting moisture up to those high altitudes and then depositing it in the form of snow. So the short answer is, uh, to your question is yes, and we are seeing that in the data and it's consistent with theory. All right, and we have uh, Kristen. If your microphone is working, you are able to ask that question live if you'd like to. You can press the talk button down to speak and then press it again when you're done. Did you want to try that, Kristen? What types of animals and plants do you see on Greenland, and have you seen any changes uh, with your research as far as what you uh, are able to see? Uh, as far as I know, Greenland doesn't seem to have a wide variety of an, uh, animals, at least. I won't speak to the plants, but mostly the tundra variety of plants you'd find in northern Alaska that you'd see there are kind of what you see in Greenland. The, the larger animals that you'd think of in Greenland that are here, we only saw a couple earlier today, there are muskox, there are caribou, they call them reindeer locally. Uh, they have Arctic hares, which are really cute uh, and white this time of year. And uh, kind of the same bird species, a lot of the bird species we see in Alaska too, lots of ravens and so on. Um, I don't, the Ice Bridge guys aren't really studying the changes uh, to the wildlife or the, the, the flora, the fauna uh, in, in this regard. They're just really studying the ice itself. So I'm not prepared to address the question. This is Jim Youngle again. One of the, the interesting things about living in the building that we're living in is it's a dorm for scientists. It's, it's a place for that a lot of scientists come through and come together. The woman who was living in the room next to mine uh, was responsible for counting muskox in the local area in regards to uh, setting harvest limits. And she had a lot of fascinating information about the change in population as they change the hunting rules and the uh, feedback that she gives the Danish government here. Greenland is a colony of Denmark and uh, while they are in the process of setting a lot of the rules locally here, but um, uh, she was responsible for going out and counting muskox and then reporting back and on the basis of her counts they changed the, the harvest limits on the hunting. So I found it very interesting to talk to her and these are people you run into when you're making breakfast in the morning or making dinner in the evening and it's, it's just a great uh, cross-section of scientists. As John Sontag said earlier, the people who drill cores into the ice uh, come through this building and we get to exchange information with them and it's, it's really a, a great place to be, a very vibrant place to be for science. Great explanation. Thank you. Kristen saying thank you. Um, and Arnold, any more questions from East High? <coughs> I have a question for him. Are there volcanoes or earthquakes in Greenland? Okay, there, there aren't any volcanoes. Greenland is, is, as Russell was saying, one of the places where the rock on the Earth is the oldest, uh, certainly more than two billion years old and up to maybe four billion years old for the oldest rock here. They don't have earthquakes per se, but they do have ice quakes. The ice is very thick, three kilometers thick. It is in motion and uh, one of the ways that scientists are studying the loss of ice is by putting seismometers around Greenland and, and really listening to the ice quakes as the ice is moving down and grinding against the bottom and breaking up. 
So another uh, fascinating uh, study that uh, you know is not part of the airborne program here, but we're exposed to in, in working with other scientists here. So great question. Yeah, there's another uh, a place where that does happen a lot. One of them is Antarctica, which I don't know all that much about the volcanism in Antarctica. I know a bit more about it in Iceland. Uh, and there's a there's a big volcano there called uh, there's a lot of volcanoes in Iceland. There's a fairly famous one called Grimsboden, which uh, is situated interestingly underneath the largest ice cap uh, in Iceland called the uh, Vatnajökull. And um, when Grimsboden seems to be on a cycle of uh, of erupting once every several years, maybe something like seven, eight, nine, ten years. And when that happens, it causes an event that, that, that not only Iceland it's an Icelandic word, but now it's, a, it's, a, it's used by scientists worldwide, it's called a jökulhlaup, and uh, a jökulhlaup means glacier flood, literally in Icelandic. And what happens is these, it's just a fascinating event, these, uh, these uh, obvious volcanoes obviously create a lot of heat, they release a lot of heat from the inner earth, and that melts a lot of that ice when they're underneath an ice cap, and then eventually that, that ice wants to find its way uh, out to the ocean. And when it does, uh, it creates a, an, a tremendous flood event. I've heard it described as six to ten times the flow rate of the Mississippi River all within a couple of days, where this, this melted ice, this huge amount of water makes its way out uh, across a plain called the Sandor uh, that, that's on the flanks of the Botany Yokel Ice Cap and makes its way out to the ocean and uh, drives out, it blows out the roads uh, and uh, other infrastructure when, the, when that happens. But it happens so often the Icelanders are used to it and uh, they just rebuild. And they're and they smart enough not to put out there, for sure. Can you spell that, John? is spelled uh, J, I believe it's uh, J-O-K-U-L-H-A-U-P. P. P. P is in Awesome, thanks. Um, and if there is any other folks uh, who want to ask questions, just let us know in the chat box. But there might be more from East High. Hi, I have a question. Given the geology of the area and the canyon, if most of the glaciers do indeed melt, what kind of ecosystems and resources would you expect to arise there? I'm not, I'm not exactly sure, but one of the uh, interesting uh, pieces of data that we get uh, from that is the fact that there's a lot of warm water coming up around the bottoms of the glaciers. That data has come from the shrimping industry here. The shrimpers put thermistors on their nets so that they can find the correct temperature of water to uh, put their nets down and harvest shrimp. And they have a history of data that we didn't know about until a few years ago. And uh, so uh, in regards to the question of, of whether warm water was melting glaciers, we were able to go to the shrimp industry here in Greenland and actually collect quite a bit of data. So obviously there, there is warmer water coming up and that's going to affect the fishing here in Greenland. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of wildlife here. The, the musk oxen and all that have plenty of room to roam around. So I'm not sure if there will be any other changes that we see, but, uh, but it, I think the changes may be more in oceanography than they are above the ocean surface, and it should be very interesting. All right, looks like Julie had a question. Maybe we'll turn it over to her. And if you want to ask your question live, just uh, click the talk button to speak and then click it again when you're done if your audio is working. Oh, Looks like you tried to use your microphone there. Click it and start talking. See if that works. Hit it just once. All right, looks like she's typing in. And okay, we'll turn it back over to Arnold. Uh, Mike from Anchorage has a question. Yeah, I'm from Anchorage here. And one thing I'm wondering is uh, you're doing some very good data collecting with uh, instrumentation. I wonder if you've tried to couple any of the changes with the uh, 
natives in Greenland and if they have any information that might be useful to help you out with your research. Yeah, this is John Sontag. Um, the answer is probably not in a very formal way that I'm aware of. Uh, that's certainly an interesting point. Uh, we do hear a lot of anecdotal information from the locals uh, in Canada, in Iceland, here, uh, everywhere really, uh, about the changes that, 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 that they've seen. Of course, they're, um, the changes that we're you know, largely interested in, a lot of them are geological timescales or near geological timescales that are much, much greater than the, than the local knowledge uh, really would allow. Uh, so, so yeah, we don't do a heck of a lot of that, although there are probably some anthropologists um, glaciological anthropologists out there who might be <laughs> interested in that kind of thing. Um, hi, Mr. Hope. This is Ellen. Um, I was just wondering why it's like so important to prevent the icebergs from melting. Um, will like the rising level of you know water will that affect you know global like issues? Like, I don't know. Like, what, would it affect us globally? Yeah, the answer to that is yes. Um, it, it will affect it. It will affect sea level globally, uh, and it won't be distributed necessarily evenly because the the way at which uh, sea level uh, as it rises um, will, will rise depending on the local gravity field, and that's greater in some places and, and less in others. But it certainly will have global impacts. And uh, Russell mentioned the Maldives earlier. That's that's a, a place that has a government that's particularly interested in this question because because their land is in such a, such a low elevation. So so yeah. But it's, uh, and, that, and sea level is indeed NASA's stated interest in this whole problem. But it's not the only problem. Um, basically, these big ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica and elsewhere, they act as buffers on the whole global climate. They, they, they tend to regulate it. Uh, you, have to, you have to melt a heck of a lot of ice before you can seriously impact uh, global temperatures. So that, that makes Greenland and Antarctica harbingers of the future, in a sense. And that's one of the, one of the main reasons we're, we're studying uh, this ice with, with uh, the intensity that we are. And Julie wanted to ask, are you noticing larger areas of open water on the ice itself and or the sea ice that may contribute to more rapid warming? And this is Jimmy Engel again with the Airborne Mapper. Um, the answer to that is yes. Uh, there's two, two aspects to this. One of them is on the land ice, on the Greenland ice shelf itself, especially around Jakobshavn on this side of Greenland. There are very, very large areas of melt ponds, especially in the summertime, where the surface ice is melting and collecting in lakes, basically, that sustain themselves for a while. Eventually, the lakes find flow paths down into the ice. And really, no one knows a whole lot about where that water is going. Uh, there's been various efforts here to um, to place dyes in the water, to place objects in the water, and figure out just where that, that water is going. Uh, next summer, there will be a program by NASA to study melt ponds. And uh, it will be using some new technology on unmanned vehicles flying out of a Lulusat, which is just uh, north and west of here a little bit. It's a smaller airport, less busy than this airport. And NASA will be flying some small Oh, eight foot wingspan UAVs with instruments on, in specifically to go over the melt ponds themselves that exist on the land ice. The other aspect is the sea ice. Uh, the sea ice, as NASA has been noting from satellites, uh, is melting quicker each year. There's less multi year ice in the Arctic Ocean. There's more open water in the summertime. And uh, this is sort of a feedback loop where as the sea ice melts and there's less and less of it, there is less white area in the Arctic Ocean and more dark blue water uh, in the Arctic Ocean. And the blue water absorbs sunlight better than the white ice does. It absorbs heat better. And so you get sort of a feedback where this, this sort of runs away. And uh, we're in that phase right now. There's a lot of interest in that because if the Arctic Ocean opens up a little bit more in the summertime, Commercial shipping traffic can move from uh, different points around the world, much cheaper than going through the Panama Canal or around the tips of South America and Africa. So uh, there's, there's quite a bit of interest in this these days. And uh, of course, it's concerning just from the fact that the climate is changing so quickly. Um, so that's, the, that's one answer to that question.
Okay. Maybe folks at East High are thinking through another question? Or you feel like you're good? Or you feel like you're good. Hey, Mr. Hood, this is Neil. You guys were saying that on the inside of the Greenland ice sheet, there were, it's pretty solid, but you were also talking about underground rivers. So I was wondering how far inland do the underground rivers start? We have no idea. It's a great question. They, they certainly they exist mainly at the lower elevations, uh, and um, and the degree to which the the different water bodies are connected with each other and connected with the ocean is a is very much a topic of ongoing study. So that's a, it's that the knowledge of that is in its infancy right now. Yeah, I agree. Uh, there's uh, you know a lot of work needs done now that we've discovered these uh, aquifers in the fern, which are relatively shallow, just uh, tens of meters below the surface, if that. And then there's these these very deep canyons that we're discovering underneath the ice cap, which could convey water because there's a lot of pressure there. Uh, a lot of heat from the earth coming up. So uh, the, the interaction between the water and Greenland is, is a wide open area of research. One of the needs of the subglacial water is, uh, is, is the concept that in, there are cases down there where some of, the, some of that water could actually flow uphill. Um, and that's because the water that is deeper is also under more pressure because there's more ice above it. And that creates a, creates a, a hydrostatic uh, equilibrium situation where the, the water will actually be forced to flow uphill because it's uh, because it's under more weight from the ice uh, above it. So it looks like uh, a bit of our audience is saying thanks and thanks for the presentation. Incredibly fascinating and enjoying it. Just real quick, I'm gonna uh, just scoot to the end here and, and again thank our team for participating. Um, and there's a lot of additional ways that folks can get involved with Polar Trek and following expeditions throughout this year. Upcoming Polar Connect events like this are going to be on our website. And thank you to the team for standing by and answering all these questions. Um, and the entirety of this recording of the um, Polar Connect event will be on our website in the next couple of days so people can revisit it. Um, and if, if there are any more questions from uh, Russell School out there? We have a message for Russell. Thanks, Russell.